Yo, 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 Thought Warriors. What is up? Higher Learning is on. It is I, Van Lathan Jr. And it's me, Rachel and Lindsay. Sweet booty birthday. It's Donnie's Donnie, birthday, guys. Donnie, happy birthday. Happy birthday, Donnie. What are you going to do? It. What are you going to do for your birthday? I'm going to edit this podcast. Oh, did you do something <laughs> this past weekend? Please say you did no, something. No, I did. Fun. I did. Uh, yeah, yesterday was my dad's birthday, actually. We got, like, back-to-back birthdays. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, we hung out, barbecued, drank, watched the Lions, put a whooping on the Chargers. It was a, it was a good Sunday. Donnie, what's your drink of choice? Uh, Crown Royal is my drink of choice. That, that, but, I, I uh, see that for you. <laughs> we I want, was uh, I wanna, I sipping want, Uncle Nearest last night, though. I want to drop that every time something like that happens. Nigger! We don't play no boogie-woogie. That's no, drink. we're not. We're not. <laughs> Seriously, that used to be. You, do, you, do you drink crown? Yeah. I well, used to faithfully drink crown. I used to carry a crown bag as a purse. Rachel, you have, ma- a, you have a th- problem. Through majority of college, Rachel, Rachel. I used to carry it, change it with the flavors because that apple Rachel, came out Rachel, around that time. Rachel, we got to help you. This is like 15 years ago. Yeah. Has it changed? Yeah. The drinking? I don't drink crown. Do I'm not you- drinking now. So you haven't, when are you, is your body going through convulsions because it doesn't have no, what it needs? No, I did 30 days without yeah. drinking and I successfully completed that. And you're that. back on the sauce. I drank and now I'm not drinking right now. Oh, Rachel, oh, are, wait a minute. So I you, know you like to think I have a drank, problem. You drank for a little while and then you stopped. I stopped again. Oh, just what the fuck I'm talking about, Rachel. So you're, I tell you what, that you're an inspiration to all people. Well, you know, I do what I can. You do. Like, that's great. How did the screening, did you, so there was no drinks last night at the screening of the movie? At the movie, at my house on Saturday? Yes, Saturday. I didn't drink. Every, oh there were drinks, God. there were a whole bunch of drinks. I didn't drink. Rachel, you're on the other side of it. That's so amazing for you. It was tough. That's why you're. <laughs> <laughs> it was tough, I'm not going to lie. But I didn't drink. Yo, man, I've checked out the movie, man. Did you watch it? You didn't come over and watch it. Nah, I'm not fucking with that. Um, it, it, <laughs> Y'all see how he does me? I went were, to your screening. You were good. You think so? I think you... I, I think actually you, was like, oh, think, it didn't translate the way I thought it would necessarily translate on screen. I think you did a good job, Rach. Did you like my knockout scene? Oh, uh, Rachel, Spoiler come on alert. now. I only actually watched that after Kalika actually put it on my <laughs> agenda to watch it. And then, we why died. did y'all do it like that? Why did y'all do the knockout scene like that? I know the other knockout scene with Jenna was better. Mm-hmm. Like even Molly, shout out to Molly who was there. She's an actress. She was like, they should have done a cutaway. For me, I just kind of gracefully fell to the ground. And I had to because there was like nothing to stop my fall. It is what it is. It's good. It was a great situation. And the movie can now be promoted because the strike is over. Mm-hmm. Everything is moving. The city's alive again. The hills are alive here in Los Angeles. It was fun. It was a really fun experience. Like, if you haven't already checked out Devil on My Doorstep, it's on Lifetime. You can get it streaming that's on like a, most streaming platforms. That's like a, the name of a rap record. Devil, devil on, on My, my doorstep. doorstep. Nigga, I got the devil my on my doorstep. My friends couldn't get it right. What it was de- like, devil get thee behind me. Devil on my front porch. I was like, y'all know, it's devil on my doorstep. Devil on my doorstep. <laughs> Donnie, how old are you today? 35. Really? Mid thirties. Right Donnie, in the middle. I thought you were in your twenties. I thought Donnie was I older. I thought Donnie was like thirty eight. Really? Oh no. I yeah. never I get that. I like always get twenty nine. So Donnie, you were born in nineteen eighty eight? Exactly. Damn. Yep. That's crazy. Why is that crazy? It's just crazy to me. Like I was full on doing stuff. What year were you born in? Nineteen eighty. Are you? Mm-hmm. I didn't realize you and Brian were born in the same year. Me and Brian. Okay. It's, it's the it's the year of the perfect bodies. My I sister was born in eighty. Perfect body. <laughs> no, weird. Is that was the year of the weird. perfect body. Me, Brian, <laughs> <laughs> Ti. Three different bodies. <laughs> like, like you know what I'm saying. Um, year of the perfect body. Year of the perfect body. <laughs> Did Brian come to the uh, the, uh, the 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 watching of the movie? Yeah, was Brian there? was there. Oh, he was there. Yeah, he was there. It was at my house. He was there. I don't know. I don't know how so I go. Here we go. I, uh, Brian don't live in my house. I'm I I never said he didn't live in the house. I didn't know that he was coming to the thing. <laughs> he was there. I noticed that you went courtside to another game. Courtside-ish. Courtside-ish. Was Brian there? No, I was invited again. You're torturing was, him. I'm a good plus one. You're torturing him. I was him. invited again. This I is I tagged a, you in it, though. <laughs> I, I know. You did it, and I saw it, and I'm like, 
I wonder if you tagged me in it because Brian was invited <laughs> and he wasn't. You're torturing him. I you do it on purpose. I went with it's, a, it's a bit, right? Amory. Shout it's out a, to Amory. I'm with it's, her. A, it's a bit now, though, right? I mean, it's a bit. It's a bit. It's a bit to go to sporting events like that and not invite one of the biggest basketball fans. I know. It's a bit. You're doing it as a bit. Well, if we, if I, if they were my tickets once again, Brian would obviously be my plus one. Yeah. But if I'm invited, what can I do? Turn it down? You no. went with uh, Emery Wiley? Mm-hmm. Shout out to Marcellus Wiley. I want to say something Marcellus. real quick. I want to tell y'all something about Marcellus Wiley. This is an example of how you cannot really agree with like 90% of something that somebody says. <laughs> but still know that they are a great person, that they are a talented person, and that that person can still be both a friend and a role model. Like, me and Marcellus, if you get us talking, we really do not agree on Same very much. Same with me and Amory. Like, we really do not agree <laughs> on very much. But Marcellus Wiley is, <laughs> is a fucking super talented guy, and I think that every, I, the reason why I can, me and him, first of all, he's just a good guy. He's just a good man. Marcellus is just a good man. But also, I actually believe that what he's saying, that he believes it. Of course, He's yes. not just Doing grifting mm -hmm. for the sake of grifting or trying to wow pe rile people up like other people are. Me and Cell don't be agreeing, but Cell is a great guy. And it's a, he a Compton nigga at heart, too. I know he wouldn't and say that. And you know what, I, what else I loved? I saw him. He was at BravoCon supporting Anne-Marie. Yeah. And he was such like a doting, proud husband. I saw him by himself and I was like, are you, I was, I said, is this overwhelming? He's like, this is so much fun. This is amazing. She was on stage. He ran up with his camera filming her. I mean, just so proud. And, you know, it's like a role reversal because mm -hmm. she supported him. Now he's supporting her, doing her thing on the stage, front and center. And I don't know. I just love to see it. Speaking of Rob, a week episode of Potomac last night. Week episode. I haven't watched it yet, but I love that you watched it before yeah. me. Yeah, watched it last night. Week. Sometimes we have what are called filler episodes. Yeah, it's a filler episode. But it's leading up to something huge. Uh-huh. So, so I do want to... Stay I, in. So you're, so you're in it. Like, I'm you're watching it. this season. I'm in it. Okay. I want to say something real quick. I don't want to ruin the episode because there's nothing to ruin. Nothing really happens you in know, the episode. Y'all already know he's about to pull out ruin the I'm not ruining it. I do want to say that I do want one of my Nigerian friends, I called Jomi last night, and... I asked Jomi, and Jomi didn't know what this was because Jomi is Yoruba. And, and she and she was she's Igbo. She's Igbo. Okay. Um, but the Osu caste system was discussed last night, and whether or not Wendy was Osu. And There's a lot of drama behind them. Wendy and the new lady? Yeah. See, the new lady was there's something there. I like it when it gets cultural, when it's real. There's something there. First of all, Ashley, I don't want to ruin it. Ashley knows how to sp oh, spark she, a flame. She knows how to Ashley stir knows the how to spark a flame. <laughs> Ashley is, and we love her for it. Ashley would be the one that's going, I, I was talking to her and she just kind of said you were kind of like, I don't know, sleeping around. So, <laughs> I mean, I didn't say it. It's kind of what she said. But I, I was like, oh, I've never heard that before. But you're kind of like, I don't know. So when she, I, it's, I'm sorry, I've been drinking. And I'm like, God damn, you're doing the thing, Ashley. <laughs> She's so good at it. And then it. she I just gets it. out of it. You know what I mean? <laughs> so there's, 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 I want to, I want to get more into, because I never knew about this. And I didn't know that I would actually learn things on Potomac. I want to get more into what the Osu caste system is in Ebo and why, like, Wendy was like, she was like, deathly afraid of being associated with that. Apparently, it's like you get outcasted from the tribe or something like that. And people were saying that her and her family were Osu. And she was like, no, <laughs> we are not that. It's just like it was, a, the other lady was like, it was abolished or whatever. But she was like, we are not that. We were having all this thing. If we were Osu, nobody would have been there. So now it's going to be about whether or not Wendy is this thing. It's, it's, so they're it's pitting cultural. the Nigerians against each other? That's going to happen. That's going to happen. I can't wait till you watch. That's going to happen. They, they pit the Nigerian ladies against each other. It's going to happen right now. Then there was, there was, uh, you guys keep talking about Mia. It was a good episode for Mia. I think Mia's going to have a really good season. You do? Mm-hmm. Yeah, she mm -hmm. had the downgrade. I really enjoyed meeting Mia too. 
Oh, so you changed. Yeah. I really oh, wait, wait, hold on for a second. Wait, because we fucking I did my list and I had me I, in there at the top. My list and, hasn't changed yet. And everyone was like, Van, your list sucks, but you changed. She's not at the top, but I really enjoyed meeting her. I mm -hmm. thought she was so nice, so welcoming. She's again, I've said this before, her timeline is always off. She cannot remember what she says, and that's frustrating. But she's very honest. And I appreciate it. Like she does not care. And that's what I wanted in a housewife. Just say it. Don't try to hide it. Just honestly be yourself. Man. What? We got a big interview on the show today. We got Pinky Cole. Slutty vegan. I'm excited to talk to Pinky uh, Cole. One of the most important entrepreneurs in the country right now. Built a brand, built a business. Such a fun person to talk to. Smart lady. Yeah. We did Revolt's Bet on Black, which you guys should be watching. Watch the show on Revolt, where Revolt and Target gave away over a million dollars to Amazing. black entrepreneurs. All right. Time to get into the goddamn show. Let's go. Let's do it. Later on, we got Pinky Cole coming up for you. We're going to talk about a lot of stuff. We're going to talk about black entrepreneurship. We're going to talk about how to become a vegan, slutty vegan, Rachel and her, her, her poor pork chop Lindsay over here. <laughs> Uh, and we're also going to talk uh, about Keith Lee <laughs> and his he, visit to he, Atlanta. He keeps coming back. Keith He's Lee. going on a tour on this podcast. Enough after this. Oh, Keith Lee's coming on higher learning. There's there's nothing else to say. What? There's a there's a lot to say. <laughs> Just, he's a revolutionary. Enough. He's, oh, lead, no. he's he, he's for the little man. I can't wait to hear Pinky's take on it. Okay. Uh, on the other side is break. Whoopi Goldberg. Look, everybody, Ashley, how old are you again? I am 27. So you're Gen Z? Yeah. I am between. I'm a between it. You're a Gen Z. That's, Gen too, Z. that's too, that's too, yeah. You're in Gen Just Z. Reaching Stop. too far back. Hey, Ashley, Everybody on, wants to be a millennial. Ashley, on some real shit? Yeah, but. So, like, Come to terms with your shit. You know what I'm saying? No, don't don't try to not be in Gen Z. That, that's what I've been told. No. No. I've been told by lots of people. It's Let's look it up I right don't now. Like, I don't like the year thing. I don't like yeah. it because I feel like we say things and you don't know. You're not in our generation. <laughs> so and Ashley will be like, what? What year were you born? 1996. Gen Z compromises people between, born between 1996 and 2010. Okay. You're Gen I've Z. I've heard other things. Why don't you, why don't you, you and, and accept so, it. Take so it. I'll accept it back for right here, now. You guys are all Gen Z oh, as well. Oh, they definitely are. I'm 26, so I'm 97. I'm, I'm, they call it Zillennial. It Girl. It's yeah. not really been defined. <laughs> Gen but Z. I'll give it to you. I'm Gen Z. I'm 29. You're just out of it. You're a, you're a, you're a uh, geriatric millennial, or you're a young millennial, or an old millennial. I guess I just feel like if you didn't have, did you have, a, young did you have an answering machine? You know, like if yeah. you if you can't flip phones, if you don't, yeah, I if, had a flip phone. That's because y'all. That's because y'all have phones at like seven. That's because and eight. No, it's because we were 13. around. And our our families were getting Damn. Damn. See, that, I had a flip phone. Stop. Okay. Fair. <laughs> so just for everybody here that's Gen Z uh, Whoopi Goldberg and the rest of the world say y'all lazy she says that <laughs> the reason why y'all can't buy houses she said millennials too millennials as well Gen Z and millennials is because they only want to work four hours a day she said this on The View Whoopi is 67 um, this was in response to uh, declining birth rates of millennials um, and Gen Z people and they're putting off having children because of economic concerns and worsening climate conditions. She's saying that this is all their fault. Run the tape. Every generation comes and wants to do better than their parents did. Every generation. But I'm sorry. If you only want to work four hours, it's going to be harder for you to get a house. Oh, and don't mention four days. <laughs> no, but... I, 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 you know, I, I, feel, I feel for everybody that feels this, but I'm sorry. We busted our behinds. Mm -hmm. We had to bust our behinds because mm -hmm. we didn't have the option of going back. Y'all gave us the housing back. crisis, though. We but, um, Listen, we had all kinds of stuff. No, coming. it's true, but I, the one problem. thing I'd say is millennials are statistically the um, first generation that's likely to do worse off than their parents. That's a you know what? Thing. That's what they said to us as well. Every, every generation is told you're going to do worse than your parents. And you know what? People pick it up and they do what they do and they raise themselves and this is what you got to do. It's called being a good citizen. I mean, the statistics are there. 
listen, the what we were taught as I'll speak for millennials, I can't speak for Gen Z. Um, Ashley, you know, feel free to jump in now that you have to accept the fact that you're a Gen Zer. Um, we were told the way to succeed, it was a very simple plan. You get your education, you go to college, you maybe go to grad school, you take these type of jobs and you will be able to have success. You will get a house, you will you know, make enough money to have a good savings, to have children and to have what was taught to us as a traditional family. It was just that simple. It's kind of how it was preached to us. It's not that simple. I mean, the what things cost, like education, for example, y'all know me and my loans, y'all get on to me about this all the time. To go to, to college, six figures, Mo- like a lot of colleges, even I went to a state school. To go to law school or any type of graduate school, a master's, a PhD, you're looking at another six figures. So you're hundreds of thousands of, of dollars in debt. The interest rates are like 8% on these loans. And so you're having to pay this back. And then with inflation, the jobs don't, and, and this is also coming out of a recession. I started law school in 2008. I went into law school as there was a recession. By the time I got out, what they were paying me as a lawyer with hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt did not cover what my bills would be and to cover my loans. I lived at home for the first year of being a lawyer because I could not afford it coming out of school. But I'm following the plan that you told me to follow and I can't afford to live like, a new lawyer, a lawyer should be living. It just doesn't match up. So when I hear Whoopi Goldberg saying this, I'm like, you're not taking into consideration what the times are. Like the cost of living is rising, but what you're paying people is not matching that. What schooling is costing isn't matching that. So there's this huge gap between the haves and the have nots and the middle class are the ones that are suffering, even upper middle class. So I just don't understand how you can have that take and not understanding. It's a very out-of-touch take. Yeah. So multiple things can be true. One of the things that is true is that the Gen Zers are sometimes uh, annoying in their entitlement. I'm sorry. It's it's sometimes annoying. It's sometimes... I talk to kids in their 20s all the time. We talked about this a little bit later uh, with, with Pinky, and they tell me about what they feel like they should be making what their worth is. What do they is. say they should make? It doesn't. I don't want to get into Like what they should be making, what their worth is and all of that. And it's good to have an idea of what kind of life you want to lead and how things would be. But it's also good to understand that like in most occupations, most industries, you are going to have to grind. Yes. Like my brother left Morehouse, went to Stanford after he went to Stanford. He went out into the uh, lion's den of the legal world and had to grind for hours and hours and hours and not doing Perry Mason legal work. Aha! Um, all, or any of that stuff, not doing that. I'm talking about going through documents with highlighters, looking for dates and times and things like that, like, like doing all kinds of stuff. And if you want to see that, you're going to have to grind and you're going to have to start somewhere, right? That's true. At the same time, this is a very, like, no one has hoarded worth uh, or hoarded wealth like the boomers. The boomers have hoarded wealth, changed the entire financial system of <laughs> of the United States of America, um, globalized, sold out, all of that stuff, right? Whoopies people, the people that came right after World War II that had all of this amazing money and wealth handed to them because of the economic boom and they all they did with it was figure out new ways to fuck the middle class. And then the children of those middle class people want to be the boomers that they see that have garnered all of this wealth and they're told a way to do it, to your point, and then they get to a thing and it's not the way. So now, mom and dad, you're so rich. You have a home. You're doing all of this. I'm going to be home a little bit longer. Plus, there are other things that we don't talk about here. Uh, the diving into the internet and living your whole life there sure. has arrested the development of a lot of these kids. <laughs> it just has. They, 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 they 
talk in concepts and not in actual life. That's they, very true. They speak in this perfect way of how the world should be and not how it actually is. But there's hairs that get split there to me. To me, I feel I find it both inspirational that the younger people that I'm around like see this world and really want to affect this world that is different than the one that we're living in now that has a different standard when it comes to climate change, has a different standard when it comes to racism and sexism, has a different standard when it comes to all of these things that we just accepted, that our parents just accepted. Sexism, uh, LGBTQ plus rights, all this. They want to change these things. They will not accept the prior world. What I do wonder sometimes is whether or not they're tough enough to get it done. I do wonder sometimes if they have what it takes to actually go out and make that world happen because there's compromise that is needed sometimes in that. There's toughness sometimes that that that, that is needed in that. Um, and sometimes you can only do it by sharpening your blade. You can't ask for it. You got to take it, right? Um, and I think all of this has to do with yeah. some of these things that we're seeing. When you talk about, I don't even feel like you can judge a lot of this based upon the old standard and the old structure. Yeah. All the factory jobs are gone. The, the the neoliberal economic policy destroyed the idea of what a, the American industry is supposed to, the American industry and economy is supposed to look like. And fuck, man, a lot of the kids that are coming now, it's almost like they're flying the plane while it's still in the air. It changes every five or 10 years and what you're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. You know? So mm -hmm. I think Whoopi is both... Uh, staring at the moon a little bit, like it's like screaming at the moon a little bit. So there's a little bit of get off my yard. But I think there's a little bit coming uh, coming to the middle for both. Is, is it annoying sometimes? Hey, I shouldn't have to come to work on a Friday. I can do all of this from home. I was talking about this. No, like if I was running an office right now, I would make y'all come in. Every day? Most days. Because I honestly think having worked in an office, let me give you an example. I, I, I agree with like, you. Like having worked in an office, I worked in an office, a tough office to work in uh, for 10 years at TMZ. The things that I learned, not just in terms of my direct professional growth, but the interpersonal things that I learned, the relationships that I learned, Ways to talk to people, ways to interact, sure. ways to do all of that. You got to be in the place to fucking do that. Absolutely. You got to be there to do that. I think that when you talk about all the change that this new generation wants to make, you know, socially, it's great. I think one of the other things that they do challenge is the way we work. And I think there is some merit to that, right? Like I, you go to other countries and they take hours off. Like they don't work, they don't work on Fridays. Like, and I think that there's some, there's a balance there where we are a very overworked society, but I think that there's this confusion of, okay, maybe if you don't work as many hours or you get a Friday off, it doesn't mean that you don't work hard in between that. Like that's where maybe there's a little bit of a disconnect. I think that we could, not focus so much on work as well. Being overwhelmed, the anxiety that comes with that. Like work, 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 work. You talk about your brother, Jabril. Yeah. You're talking about Jabril. I know what it's like to come from a um, an industry where it's like all about what you build. And you're a workhorse and it's terrible for your mentality. It's terrible for your family, your personal life. Um, and it's, and like you become a machine to it. So I understand fighting against that with, less hours that you work or less days that you work, but it doesn't mean that you still can't put in the work. I think there's also with this newer generation of this, whether it's social media, the internet, whatever you want to call it, this this connection to fast money. Like I want to make money quick. And I think the internet and living in the world we live in today makes us think that to achieve success, it happens very quickly overnight because of how we're watching it play out on social media. We have Pinky Cole on. She'll tell you that that's not the case. But there's this disconnect where people don't see that, right? Like they think they go from A to Z and that's it, hmm. rather than putting in that work in between. But I do think here, Whoopi is totally disconnected from the reality of it. I had to leave legal to actually, I if I was still uh -huh. working as a lawyer, I probably wouldn't have the house that I have. Definitely not in California. Yeah. I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be able to own a home. 
I really wouldn't. I mean, I, it's just, it's just very hard. The amount of work that I was giving, the amount that I was paid would not allow me to be able to compete in the same way with inflation. So last thing I'll say about it. There is something that I think is valuable about challenging the American standard. Tell you what I mean. As we talk about other countries and the way that they work and how they function. There are two things about this that we have to remember. Whenever, whenever we're talking about how another country works, mm-hmm. one thing is those countries care about their people, which we do not. Okay? And there are reasons why. Another, another uh, thing about that is very often the countries that we, that we mention are not competing with us. Mm-hmm. The boomers and their parents came out of an intense period of competition, both domestically and internationally. The domestic competition was for rights, riches, values, morals. All of that stuff, right? The adolescence of the country, 60s. People competing for what civil rights mean. People competing for the American dream. Because they don't tell you this, but the American dream is certainly a competition. It's certainly a competition. It's capitalism. What you get, somebody else doesn't. Fact. Okay? In order for Jeff Bezos to exist, a lot of motherfuckers got to be homeless. It's facts. Now, it doesn't have to be that way, but in the way that we're doing it, that's the facts. Okay. There's also international competition. Huge international competition. We have to be the best. There's an existential danger to the world and to civilization that is out there from the Soviet Union, from communism, from whatever else, all of this stuff. So we need more bombs. We need more money. We need more of this. We're competing with someone at all mm-hmm. times. That means that you got to work. That means you got to work. You got to go out there and you got to work. You got to be a part of the machine that builds America. You got to be a part of that. You got to work. You got to serve in the armed forces. You got to do that honorably, patriotism. They're they're evil over there. And if that person, if that thing, America is a capitalist engine, if that thing to compete with globally doesn't exist, then we got to invent it. So now it's China. Now it's Russia. Now I'm not saying these countries aren't really, aren't competing with us as well because we've Americanized the world. Mm -hmm. We've made ourselves this big, huge deal. It doesn't matter unless it happens in America and all these other places are going, well, we want it to matter if it happens here. Right? Um, In order to change that dynamic, there has to be a a redefinition of what America is, right? Because when I see, I saw a video that said, I'm in Tokyo, this is the way things are in Tokyo and New York should learn from that. Well, I mean, New York will never be Tokyo. It doesn't matter. New York will never want to be Tokyo. New York will never want to be Tokyo because there's so many different types of New Yorkers that. It, it, and and that's such a homogenous place that there are things that Harlem needs that places in uh, the the Upper West Side are going to be like I don't want the niggas to have that they just don't want black they don't want you to have it there are things that that uh, Latino people need that, that they're going to be like ah they don't need that that stuff is for us like we're the true Americans so all of these other countries that hey we get a fourth day off or places in Scandinavia where they play like they pay like a 65, 70% tax rate where, and, and, and things are, <laughs> the, there's utopias <laughs> in a way uh, things are happening. They, everybody fucking cheers on tax day because it's time to pay into the things that didn't work out for them. The prisons are fucking clean. Yeah. The crime is down. All School of that stuff. School is free. School Healthcare is free. Is free. Like, it's it's not, so clean it's, there. <laughs> it's not that America can't do it. It's that America doesn't want it. Yeah. Like they don't want it. They want niggas to have to serve hard time in bad prisons because those guys are dangerous. So stop. Stop asking New York to be Tokyo. Stop comparing us to Italy where the Italians have said, you know what? We'll be a middle of the road country, but we're going to do it in style. They don't want that. And if you ask, you don't want that because it it would take a completely different way of living life. It's not about, you know, 
I could do it. Doggy dog. I would love it. I would fucking thrive in Italy. Have you been? Oh, you've been, would, you haven't yeah, been. Yeah, I've been. Yeah, I would fucking Tuscany. I would fucking thrive in Italy. That's my type of shit. Would you do Sc- a Scandinavian country? Which yeah, one? but Which one? I, I mean, Denmark. That would be Denmark. It would be good, but I do wonder about the nigga situation there. I don't know. I've been. Is it cool? I mean, we we're filming. So, yeah. I think I I don't know, but I had a good time. I would I do there. a country of black Scandinavia. Just us hanging out. <laughs> Healthcare, all of this stuff. For, all of this stuff we could do it. We don't want to do it. Because there's this toxic competition that exists in America, and that's the way that we separate. Sure. All right, look, I gotta say something, man. Do you know what? You know the most dangerous place for a black man right now? Where? Running for the GOP presidential <laughs> nomination, man. In the that last the month, thing. the GOP then took down two niggas. Well, it was only a matter of time. And man. I want to say, man, we even get talk about it, man. R.I.P. Larry Elder's campaign. Play it, Donnie. It's your campaign, Larry! <laughs> <laughs> uh, fatherlessness. One again. Larry Elder is out. And just as we fucking got to a point where we got to learn about Mindy, Tim Scott, dropped out of the GOP fucking campaign, man. He dropped out of the GOP primary. It's very sad, man. Donnie, play the audio. This is this is tough. When I go back to Iowa, it will not be as a presidential uh, candidate. I am suspending my campaign. I, I think the voters uh, who are the most remarkable people on the planet have been really clear that they're telling me uh, not now, Tim. I don't think they're saying Trey, think no, Trey. but I do not think now. they're saying <laughs> not now. And so I'm going to respect the voters and I'm going to hold on and keep working really hard and uh, look forward to another opportunity. Was she by his side when he made that comment? I no, mean, he was that? on Fox News. He was on um, the show. He was in like the little box, TV box. I'll tell you whose box he's never been in. Okay, listen. <laughs> <laughs> this is so sad for Tim. You don't like it. it, it it's, I mean, we knew it was coming, mm-hmm. but on the hills of the announcement of the alleged girlfriend, it's just like people were more interested in this woman standing beside him than they were in anything that he had to say in running for president. Mm-hmm. Anything. I, I, like, Tim, I mean, do you think, do you think, you said this before on the podcast, do you think that he wants to run, not run, but do you think he will be on the ticket for vice president. Because um, Trump has not said anything bad about him. Yeah. And actually is like rooting for him in a way. So, I, you know, I, I think that Tim Scott is such a poor candidate that I don't know what anyone would get from adding him to the ticket. I do. What? If Trump added him to his ticket. Negro. Exactly. Hmm. Which is why he's a senator. And I'm not taking away, I'm not saying he's not a smart man by any means. I'm just saying when he became senator, they thought that his rep- representation would bring other black people into the party. They thought that he was going to be like leading them into the promised land of the GOP, not realizing that he nothing that he stands for, not nothing, but a lot of the things that he stands for are not reflective of what the Black community wants. So I absolutely think that there is something to be gained by Trump adding him to the ticket. Because you can't, in his mind, you can't say he's racist if he has a Black man as his running mate. If I was Trump and I was going to choose a Black man to roll with me, it would be Byron Donalds. Okay. I, it would be Byron Donalds. To me, um, it, it, Tim Scott is just... He doesn't, he he checks the black box, but he doesn't <laughs> check the box of someone who in any way has the gravitas to make it happen. At least Byron Donalds, who is as MAGA as they come, you know what I mean? At least he he's strong enough to have like a perspective or a point of view. There's something there. The nigga got a weed charge back in the day. <laughs> you know, there, there's, there's, there's he's a story anti-the there. anti the slavery in Florida. Anti the slavery in Florida. I mean, it, it, you know, Tim Scott came out against that too, but I'm just saying, Tim Scott's campaign here, it wasn't that 
America wasn't ready. It wasn't that they were telling him not yet. They were telling him, no, brother. Never. Never. <laughs> Whatever it is needed to be president, he just doesn't fucking have it. He wasn't cosplaying president. He was cosplaying a black guy running for president. <laughs> he was two degrees fake. Like, no one believes Tim Scott. Tim Scott is the classic weak politician. And it was only unveiled in his unsuccessful bid for the GOP. It's, it's like, it's a joke. And by the way, the Mindy thing, this was probably when the donors went, hey, Tim, it's over. <laughs> Tim, hey, I'm like, bro. Nobody believes that. T Tim, Tim, it's over. Tim. <laughs> so how, let me ask you this. Will Tim and Mindy get married? Um, no. Mindy's already out the door. She served her purpose. You think Mindy's gone? I don't think Mindy was really ever there, but, yeah. you know. The, the right follow-up question would have been on Fox, so how are you and Mindy doing? How's Mindy taking the news? That's what I would have asked. That's what I would ask, too. Like, what's going on with Mindy? You and Mindy going to go on vacation? Step away for a second? Get your mind off things. Where do they go? What are you? What are you and Mindy's holiday plans? Yeah, what, what, what's, these, what's are the, these are the correct questions. I want to talk to Mindy. Well, I want to get Mindy on the podcast. Yeah, can we reach? Her, can we reach, reach out, out to, to Mindy, her? man? I want to know what Mindy. I want to. This is the first guy, black guy, Mindy's ever been with. Does Mindy have a history in chocolate? Chocolate history. Chocolate history with Mindy. That's the name of the segment. I want to know. I want to know more about Mindy because he had to invent a girlfriend. Like Odell Beckham Jr. did at the draft. He in order did? To <laughs> look that shit up. Like, <laughs> Wait, what was the story? Look it up. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> like he had to invent a girlfriend in order uh to to make his presidential campaign run smoothly. It's 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 crazy. All right. Um speaking of white women. The Marvels flopped. Is that a movie or a show? It's a movie. Okay. Uh, stars three women: Brie Larson, Tiana Paris. What did and, we switch and over to? Ringerverse. Yeah, I mean it's a topic. The movie flopped because of sexism. Did you not want to um, talk about it? Oh, see, you don't care about women. But I didn't so watch you, you, it. You don't, I didn't even... How did this sneak into the rundown? Donnie? Donnie, how did yeah, this... Yeah, this is a late ad. This, this is a late ad. That I was not a part of. So I... <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. Talk about it. I didn't see it, and it's not because of sexism, but go ahead. Oh, it's because you don't support women. No, I didn't even know this came out. This is a problem. See, you didn't see the movie. You didn't know the movie came out. But a I movie. don't... To be fair, I don't see any Marvel movies. Okay, but let me tell you something. Let me tell you why you are the problem. You are the problem, Rachel. Okay? You're the problem. This is a movie directed by Nia DaCosta. That's a black woman. That's the first black woman to direct a Marvel movie. This movie needed to be a success. It has three female leads, two of color, a female villain that is a black woman. Oh. And guess what? The movie was delightful. I went and saw it. I had a lot of fun. They had flurkins. They had all kind. They had a planet where everybody just fucking sings. It was delightful. But you know what? Because of women like yourself. <laughs> no, don't do that. Pork chop wins. <laughs> didn't support this movie. And now $47 million domestically, which is by far, those are A24 numbers, by far the worst opening Damn. in the history of a Marvel movie. Marvel took a chance on a black female director who is great, Nia DaCosta, took a chance on a female-led movie with a black villain and black ladies. I don't want to say black ladies. I don't put it all on black ladies. And women... You see how that's that, like creeped out of them? Women didn't show <laughs> up for the movie. Okay. I don't see Marvel movies, so I it had I didn't even know this was coming out. I might have seen a poster, but I, I'm sure I looked at it in pure confusion because I didn't understand what it was because they couldn't advertise this. Yeah. And now that I'm not with Extra, I'm not I'm not 
you know, I don't have the privilege of knowing all the movies and TV shows that are coming out. I'm back into my space of not knowing anything. Before, yeah. we were on a high, three-year high. It's It's gone now. But I didn't see it. You didn't tell me. Like, wait, excuse me. I blame you. How's it my fault? You never said, hey, Rachel, I think there's a great movie that's coming out with wait, leads listen. of color, with wait, a black listen. director, in the same way you just hyped it out now. Am I right? Thank you. You didn't say to me, I think this is one that you might enjoy. We should all go see, this? see it. See how this happens? I know that the strike just ended, but there, there wasn't a whole, you know, there wasn't a whole push for this movie because you couldn't publicize it because of the strike. Yeah. I really think that you should use your platform to advertise this movie wow. now that you can. We got to so do tough. a last minute push so because this is a historic movie and you failed me. Yeah, accountability. You failed me. See what I'm saying? Accountability. You know what? I'll take that. And you I'll should. Take, I'll take that. That's the only what? thing you do. Because I know that as a woman, accountability is a dirty word to you. So I'll, 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 I'll take... It's <laughs> <laughs> starting to hit home. Look, like, look, look. She doesn't like it. She doesn't like it. starting to hit home. Um, the movie is... I, I, look, at it's not a perfect film. Obviously, we the end of Marvel and the problems at Marvel and Disney have been overstated over the last year, but really here in the last six weeks when this movie was about to um uh, to release. The movie is a lot of fun. It's not the best superhero film you'll ever see, but it certainly, it certainly doesn't deserve this, right? And there are people who are dynamonists. A YouTube personality named Nerd Roddick who always gets in it when it comes to woke films, I will invite Nerd Roddick onto this podcast and and and, and talk to them, him, about why he hates any type of diversity or representation in these films. <laughs> One million views under 24 hours, a video called The Marvels is Awful, in which he criticizes Disney's push for representation. He says he calls it the MCU. <laughs> All right. Uh, ben Shapiro called it woke garbage. It's a superhero movie right. that's fun with an amazing performance from Iman Vellani. It's just, it's a, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun, but because it's ladies, people like Rachel and people like Ben Shapiro don't support the movie. <laughs> this well, you is know, you, that's my guy. Rachel, Rachel Shapiro. It's you. I knew a Rachel Shapiro in high school. Um, it's your fault that I didn't see it. See? It's it's a hundred percent your fault. No accountability. Why no would accountability. I know about it? Because no you are quick to tell me about other Marvel things that I told happened. Kalika about it. She went and saw. It. She loved it. You're quick to tell me about other things, but you didn't tell me about this. And I have to. I have to. Or you should ask yourself why. I've seen it. Why didn't you want to tell me about twice? This? Well, see it twice. Well, you could have promoted it on this very podcast. Yeah, okay. Did we'll y'all talk about it on Ringerverse? Yep. Bunch of different ones. Boom. Already did it. Craziness. Try to come at me. I know what's going on. They could on. have had a new fan in me. Fan in me. Nah, it wouldn't have happened because you like you guys. You guys talk about you want movies like this, but then you won't go support them. You say we want movies with female led directors. We want movies with black female directors. We want movies with LGBT. This is the same fucking thing that happened in the Buzz Lightyear movie where there was the same sex kiss in the movie. And I came back on here and I was like, look, Disney was pressured to have more representation. The movie comes out, then y'all ain't gonna see the movie, which tells them, stop doing it. And you wanna tell them to do more of it when, when, whenever they do it, it flops. It's just like, okay, there should have been a whole, you talk about me, this is the, the whole WNBA argument. A lot of ladies come to me and they say, hey, the WNBA doesn't get enough. And I say, hey, who is your favorite WNBA player? And they don't fucking have anybody. So how are you gonna tell me the WNBA needs more. Well, you can't tell you that it needs more. They should have went and saw this movie. The movie was good. You know what? Next week, this is what I'll do. I'm taking 10 people to see the Marvels next week. 10. Next Saturday. I might be out of town. See? What I'm talking about? <laughs> but it doesn't mean I can't go see it on my own. Well, I understand it. <laughs> Like, is there a background that I need to know before going in? No, they, they do a pretty good job. Of okay. Out there. Yeah. Um, but all seriousness, uh, I, it's my hope that 
uh, the movie, which has decent word of mouth from MCU fans, will hold. And if the movie holds a little bit, has a big second week, um, maybe it's not as bad, but this is pretty bad. The movie has a $200 million budget. So yeah. 47 million the first that's week. That's a big hit. That's, that's, a, that's a big deal, you know. Ant-Man failed as well. So it's not just, it's not a, part of this is a, a reaction to what's going on in Marvel, but stuff. All right, Pinky Cole, uh, we're going to talk to her about everything. Slowly Vegan, her new book is out. I hope you fail. It's a amazing foray into the mind of an entrepreneur. She joins us next on Higher Learning. Check it out. There are a lot of entrepreneurs, change makers in the world. This one, the lady coming on the podcast right now is one of my absolute favorites. Uh, a really inspiring story, a go-getter, outspoken, successful, all of the adjectives that you can use. Pinky Cole is joining us today on Higher Learning. We're going to talk about her new book, I Hope You Fail. Oh, my God. So when I was writing my book, they were like, get a title that jumps off of the... the Jarring. Like, they, <laughs> get a title that, that, that jumps off of the shelf with somebody. And I Hope You Fail is certainly one. Pinky, thank you for joining us. Why is that the title of the book? Because I'm crazy. <laughs> I'm crazy. <laughs> um, you know, it's so funny. First of all, um, I was a commencement speaker for Clark Atlanta University last year. And I was the youngest commencement speaker at CAU, which is my alma mater. And I said, you know what? I am going to make the theme, I hope you fail. And in that theme, I want to talk about how I was Miss Clark Atlanta University. And when I graduated, I did not have a job. Did I have any opportunities? I did not have any internships. And I had to literally figure life out on my own. So I talked about how my father did 22 years in prison, how I had a restaurant that failed and my wages got garnished and all of these things and life just started lifing for me. But on the flip side of that, I've been able to grow and evolve to a very successful business owner, to starting a multi-million dollar company that is now a household name, to becoming a mother when doctors told me that I wouldn't be able to have kids. So mm -hmm. I said, you know what? I'm going to make this a book to show people practical steps and how to identify the mindset, mm -hmm. right? Like everything we do is literally about our mindset. So if you can change your mind, you can really change your life. And it just manifested just so effortlessly. And here we are. I hope you feel. And obviously I'm a woman of many crazy names. <laughs> as you Slutty vegan. And my last book was Eat Plants, Bitch. Um, so I hope you feel <laughs> just right on target. <laughs> Um, and Pinky, you are a member of which sorority? I'm your soror, Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. <laughs> <laughs> Just so wanted to put that out there. Hey, soror. Hey, soror. Give a little oop for how you learn it. Oop. That's right. That's right. Because Van, <laughs> I, I don't know if you know, but Van be hating on us hard. Don't hate hard. on us, man. I don't, I don't hate it's it. the 11th hater statement. I Is love the Deltas. <laughs> it's just that she mad because... Kamala Harris is the vice president and she at AKA. I'm not playing okay. with you. But she secretly it. probably wanted to be a Delta. So it's like, <laughs> Thank you. Exactly. And clearly Deltas are on this podcast doing big things like Pinky. Now, yeah. I, I said that the title was jarring. Like I had to look at it a couple of times. I was like, wait, is this really how I'm reading it? And you say yeah. that there are 10 hater statements that are holding you back from getting everything you want. And the titles of these chapters are like just as jarring as the title of the book. I hope he cheats on you. Yes. I hope you don't believe in yourself. Why? Can you talk a little bit, especially about that, because that's the first chapter of the book. I hope you don't believe in yourself. You don't hear people say that. Why was that the first chapter of the book? Why do you say that, that you hope people don't believe in their, themselves? I believe that a good majority of people in our world are jarred by fear, right? A lot of us live in a state of fear that we, we want to do things, but we stand in our own way, right? We say that we have the ability to do it, but then our capacity won't allow us to acknowledge that we really can do it. So oftentimes the key to unlock your potential is realizing that you can take the first step and already be halfway there, but you got to get out of your own way to believe that like you can say and do all of the things that you think about. So like, I've had moments where I didn't believe in myself, obviously, right? But you got to fight through that. And a lot of people really don't know how to do that because of generational trauma, because of the things that happen in your upbringing and how you grow up in your environment and all of these things. So I really wanted to dissect 
what that looks like and show people like, okay, all right, here we are. You, you are plagued by fear. There's something that's holding you back that absolutely had to happen in your childhood or in your present. But now once you release that energy, you can go out and manifest and do all the things that you want to do very practically. And this is not one of those kind of like self-help book, like all you got to do is just sit and pray and just wait for the answers to come. No, this ain't that. This is, okay, all right, get up. Stop feeling guilty for yourself. Like, don't be a victim. Right. You got to get above and rise above all the things that hold you back so that you can get to the success that you've been waiting for. So that is one of my favorite titles. My other one is I hope he cheats on you. That's that's the one that (laughs) stood out to me. I said, what? Uh, Okay, you know, I mean, all great women, not all great women, but a lot of us have been cheated on before. But guess what? That was the best thing that could have happened to me because it showed me what love was supposed to look like and what love was not supposed to look like. And I feel like it laid the foundation for me to be able to find my now husband because I just got married in June. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. But I wouldn't have been able to go through all those things had not had all those bad apples. So experience really is the defining moment of learning lessons in your life that really will ultimately make you better. Mm. Number nine of Pinky's Ten Commandments is my favorite one. (laughs) I'll tell you why. Be grateful for brokenness. This is an impossible an impossible lesson to teach the people. I yeah. get so many kids, when I say kids, I mean people in their 20s mm-hmm. that are telling me, yo, I just need this. I don't have the money yet. I don't have this yet. And for me, I'm always telling them, I'm like, this time is when you figure out your worth, your resourcefulness, like mm-hmm. glom on to the fact that you can't compete on Instagram just yet and understand like perfect your craft, get Mm -hmm. better. The fact that you don't have all of these burdens financially and stuff, be grateful for the fact that the abundance isn't there yet. And when you get it, you'll understand how to operate it. But I can't make that point, especially now. It's harder to make that point. Mm -hmm. How do you get people to understand that this thing doesn't happen overnight? This is a journey. And sometimes you're going to be flush. And sometimes... You're going to be busted. It's hard, Pinky. Mm -hmm. It's very hard. But you know what I tell people? It's so funny because this is non-traditional advice. Money don't pay the bills. Confidence is the vessel that gets you to the money that pays the bills, that gives you the abundance that you're talking about. All of the opportunities I've gotten is because I've been confident in going out and shooting my shot, right? You know, we talk a lot about shooting a shot, but shooting my shot and being brave in my approach to building new relationships, to being creative and resourceful on social media. And that ain't required money. When I first started Slutty Vegan, I didn't use money for my marketing, right? I just went on social media and used free applications to do all the things that I wanted to do. But it was the confidence and knowing that I could do all of those things and build all those relationships that really opened up the doorway for people to pay attention to me. And when people started paying attention to me, guess what that did? It garnered in money and resources and opportunity that allowed me to have the abundance to be able to pay the bills. And people really don't understand that formula. People walk into opportunities like, I can't do this unless I get the money. That's not true. Mm -hmm. If you're resourceful and creative, you can do whatever it is that you want to do. Yes, money is the gateway to freedom to do all the things that you need to do to unlock a world in which you don't have to worry. And we know that. But before then comes a pathway where, okay, all right, if I just go up to people and show my product, right? If 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 I go on social media and build a page that that comes off as lucrative, if I get a camera and take pictures of my product and do all the things that I do, then it'll make people pay attention. And then on top of that, my story has to be so zip tight. People got to believe in me and what I'm selling and what I'm doing, and that will unlock the opportunity for you to garner in money, right? Like I don't leave with money. I, I'm very intentional on what I do. Even in this moment, I got a business that's doing very well, a couple of businesses that's, that's doing very well, but I'm not driven by money first because the minute that I'm driven by money first, I lose it all, hmm. right? Because that's that can't be the, it's important, but it cannot be the driver. So what, do, what, is, what, do you, what drives you though? What drives you? It's not the money. Is it the process? Is it the inspiration? It's the experience. experience. It's the experience, Mm -hmm. right? So I'm in a service-based business. 
I'll give you an example. I just had an event yesterday. It was called American Sesh. I don't know if you guys heard about it, right? So American Sesh is this platform where I'm putting celebrities in a room together with like people who don't have no money, with creative executives. And in that room, it's all about the experience. It's about how people feel when they leave you. So if I can make people feel happy when they leave me, if I can have that emotion evoked, then I know that they'll come back again and again. Then I know that they'll tell their friends to come back and then the support will start driving in. And then as a result of the support, that is when the money is going to come. Mm. And, and when you feed that way, that is how you win, in my humble opinion. Does mm. that make sense? It does. Yeah, make yeah sense. it does. You, yeah. you refer to yourself as an expert in failure. And I love this because a lot of times people see, oh, you have all this success, but then they don't see the the work, the process, everything that it took for you to get there or and the failures and the no's. Um, you talk about having to start over a few times. How do you use starting over as an overall tool, a motivational tool, I should say? So how do you use starting over as a as a motivational tool? I'm like I start over every day. <laughs> <laughs> For real, every day feel like a marathon. Like I feel like I'm on a football team and I'm getting ready for the big game every day. Mm -hmm. And there's going to be speed bumps along the way, right? There's going to be moments where I get frustrated, where times feel hard. Like, yeah, I'm in business, but business ain't always pretty. And if somebody tell you that, then they lying, mm. right? Like there's days that I feel like I want to throw in a towel sometimes. But every single day that I wake up, I get the opportunity to reset and recharge. I get the opportunity to do it all over again, which is why I love entrepreneurship so much because guess what? You can make your own rules. If I mess up today, tomorrow, I can do it all over again. I'll give you an example. Just recently, and I'm transparent about this story because this is a part of what comes with the process of entrepreneurship. I was on the New Yorker one day, nine page. Okay, I'm like, yes, life is good. Life is great. Okay, they did a nine page story on me. The next day, Jet Magazine did a whole cover on me. I'm in Target stores. Like, I'm popping. I'm like, okay, I'm on top of the world. We out here. The, <laughs> we out here. <laughs> and then the very next day, mm. after the Golden Globe Awards, in an 11 o'clock news segment, I'm all over the news. Pinky Cole of Slutty Vegan is getting sued for unpaid wages. And I'm like, we is? What happened? Mm. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. yeah. So that was very difficult for me as an entrepreneur because here I am, the Delta the overachiever, the Miss Clark Atlanta diversity, the person that everything that I put my hands on turns to gold. So now I'm offended. You're trying to see me? Mm -hmm. Like, when I only operate with integrity, but I tell you all that to say that it was hard to go through that. But, the next day and the day after it got easier because I got to start over. And even though it didn't feel like it in that moment, that level of what society may perceive as a failure was really a lesson learned and an opportunity for me to focus on my best practices, to do things a little bit differently so that this never happens again, right? To understand the processes in my business, to really identify, well, what is really going on? You know, as right. a CEO, of the company, most CEOs aren't touching every single space in their business. Right. Mm -hmm. They're just the, 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 the face of the brain um, most times these days, especially me. You know, I do a lot of thought leadership, but I say all that to say that I get an opportunity every single day to start over and starting over feels so good. Is it hard sometimes? Absolutely. But I make the rules. And as long as I make the rules, I can start over as much as I want to. I was going to ask you about that because with brands led by black people sometimes, it's really important for us to know the head of the company. Pinky Cole, Slutty Vegan, Bum B, Trill Burgers, other things like that. Like, the celebrity part of running the business is very important in the messaging of the business and in the mm -hmm. growth of the business. But that can also be something that is, you know, a detriment because most businesses have issues with them something happens, but they don't look at it as a slutty vegan thing. They look at it as a pinky cold thing. They look, mm -hmm. I don't know the guy who runs in and out So if mm -hmm. in and out got sued, I'd be like, oh my God, in and out Burger got sued. Like, what's going on with in and out But if it's it's not slutty vegan, vegan suit, it's you getting sued. They look yeah. at it as Pinky is not doing what Pinky said she was going to do. Mm -hmm. Does that ever make you want to step back from the forefront and the light a little bit and kind of just let these businesses talk more than being as out front. I've asked this to Bun too. I was like, Bun, 
do you want to be Mr. Trill Burgers forever? And he was like, no, nah, I'm very proud of my product. I, I want to be out there doing it. Does it, anything ever make you want to step back? So, you know, that's a really, really good question. So my dynamic is a little bit different. Mm -hmm. So I'm the fa I ran my company for almost three years straight. My company is five years old. And I'm talking about like I was a janitor, HR, accountant, <laughs> flipping burgers, shaking fries for almost three years straight without a full on team. Right. But then I realized in order for me to be able to grow and scale this business, I got to bring in people as smart, if not smarter than me to help take the brand to the next level. So I enlisted my now president. His name is Jason. So he comes from Google, comes from Amazon, sold his own company. So obviously prior to this, he, he was a really good friend of mine, but he's very smart, right? He's very yeah. technical. So I knew that he could focus on the strategy of the business and growing the business operationally and bringing in the right people while I focus on what happens on the outside, right? So back in the day, most people didn't know who was the face of the brain, but it's a new day and age in business. Mm. And it's interesting because I never wanted to be the mascot of Slutty Vegan. It just happened that way because when people started to dissect what Slutty Vegan represented, they're like, well, let's peel back the layer and find out who the genius behind the brand is. And as a result, it kind of pushed me to the forefront, mm. right? So after pushing me to the forefront for so long, I can no longer just walk in my store and go back and flip burgers. I can, but guess what happens? Everybody want my autograph. Everybody want to talk to me, which is a great problem to have because obviously people love and appreciate the brand, but we've been able to dissect, okay, all right, this is what's important that you focus on. And this is what I focus on. When you see all um, slutty vegan in the news, that's because Pinky Cole is doing interviews. Mm. That's because Pinky Cole is focusing on the marketing. So one job is not harder than the other. They're equally as hard. I'm just not using my hands. So mm. to answer your question, when you say like, does it make sense to go back into the business? At this point in the game, it's my responsibility to delegate and hire the right people who have that level of expertise that can grow and run the company. Because the idea of the exercise is to scale a business to unlock generational wealth. You know, a lot of people in our community don't talk about um, selling their company or like IPOs and all that stuff. They, they just expect you to just hold on to it forever. But the reality of it is, is you want to build something super, super great. And then if you make the decision to go off and do something else and do something great, you should be able to do that, especially after you built this robot of a machine that can stand on its own. And, and that really is my focus. And I'm in a good place. I'm happy where I'm at. I'm happy with the team that I have. And it's only going to get better. I'm at, uh, one follow-up. Yeah. That's interesting that you said that. There is a push-pull in the community, and you just talked about it, about ownership and selling your business. Every time somebody sells something, people go, damn, I can't believe they sold mm -hmm. it. You sell Versus. Damn, we have Versus. <laughs> versus was ours. You sell your masters. Damn, mm -hmm. I can't believe they sold their masters. And there's always this... this Why thing. is that? <laughs> I'm asking you. Like, like you're, like you, I'm asking you. It's like, for somebody that's looking at being an entrepreneur, Holding on to a business, owning a business versus selling a business. What's the wisdom on that from your from your standpoint? Like we want ownership, but we also want capital. What, what's more important? I'm going to be totally transparent. And this is unpopular opinion, right? I will always have an equity stake in my business. Mm -hmm. But there's going to come a time where as a creative, remember, I'm a creative first, right? Yeah. Like I'm not a numbers person. I'll be honest about that. I am a creative genius. I like to build. I like to create. But there's going to come a time where I'm going to want to exit. Mm. I, I exit from the business. I exit like... And until you get on that side of blood, sweat, and tears, and you get exhausted from running a company, a startup company at that, it's not easy. And yes, you love your business, but it's just like a relationship, right? Everything has an expiration date, whether you like to believe it or not. And with that expiration date, it does not have to be a bad thing. I honestly believe that I'm nearing my ceiling in my business. And mm. when I say that, I mean, like, I've never run a multi-million dollar company before. Right. So mm -hmm. I said, I'm being transparent. I'm doing the best that I can. I've had, I had the right team, but I have to be selfless and not selfish in my business and understand that one day I'm not going to be able to run this business no more because I've reached my capacity. I've reached my ceiling. And when CEOs can get honest about that, then you can make room for the business to truly grow. So at the time that I bring in people, whether it's private equity, if I bring in more investors, 
It's because I want the level of expertise to take my vision to the next level, to a place where I probably couldn't take it. And that's okay to to be real with yourself. Mm. But I realized that in our communities, it's just like, it got to stay here. It got to stay there. No, my business is still going to flourish. I want my people to still support it. And I'll still, if I sell my company today, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to roll over some of that equity stake into the business so that I always have an investment interest in my business. I'll never just give up my company 100% and say, all right, bye, y'all, I'm going on the beach. No, (laughs) I'll have an investment interest because guess what? I built this company not to make money. I built it because I wanted to help people to reimagine food and I wanted them to have a really, really good experience, which is what I care about. That will never change. But we got to get into more of a progressive mind state when we understand that, okay, if she was to sell this business or any other business, guess how many opportunities it would create for our community, right? right? Yeah. How many businesses we can support at that point. And, and when people can understand that level of education, I think that we'd be a lot better off. Mm. Yeah, I think people, I, I, I don't think that's an unpopular opinion. I love what you said. And I think that people get caught up in who you're selling the business to. But that's why I think it's so important that you as Pinky Cole is associated with Slutty Vegan because I'll always associate you as a black woman to this brand, no matter what you end up doing with the company. And and that's what I love. And I also love too, because I don't necessarily associate vegan with the black community. And mm-hmm. I find being a vegan intimidating. Okay, are you? Could you be a vegan? Really? So I thought, yes. so let me tell you something. I, I had the slutty vegan though. And after I had the, I'm not even bullshitting y'all. Y'all can say, well, you know what? Y'all can always be like, oh, Van came no. before his homegirl. I had the slutty <laughs> vegan. And after I had the slutty vegan, I was like, yo, if I had to be a vegan, I could do it. But the proof is in how successful yeah. the business is. So nobody can come at you. I want to know, because I do feel like, like I said, I think it's intimidating to be a vegan. I'm like, I don't know if I could do it. Mm. What, how do you approach that? What's the guide, if there is even a guide, to being a vegan? Where do you, where do you other than starting at your restaurant, where would you start? What <laughs> advice? <was> thing. <laughs> what advice would you give to me? Because I'm already halfway there. I don't do dairy, just because I find it absolutely disgusting. Do you, do you eat beef and pork? <sighs> do I eat pork? It's hey, <laughs> Pinky, let me tell you something. <laughs> she just, you eat pork, you might go eat dairy at this Pinky, point. <laughs> Pinky, let me tell you something. She talking about she halfway to be a vegan. You ask this motherfucker what she want to eat, and she talking about I want a fucking triple thick pork chop. I never I fucking, love pork I never fucking, I never fucking like seen somebody it, it, since my daddy, rest in peace, that eat a big hunk of fucking pork. I love it. Like it's like a I big love it. fucking slab of pig, and she love it. I lo- help me. So, <laughs> so, so I'm gonna help you right now. First of all, if you eat pork, you might as well eat dairy, okay? Because pork is worse than dairy. Okay, <laughs> that's the first thing. But he, here's a practical step that you do. First okay. of all, it, do it in stages. Eliminate pork. We're gonna go from the hardest to the least hardest. Eliminate pork first, right? It's mm-hmm. funny because I only know like two people in the world that eat pork. I'm like, are you okay? Thank <laughs> you. Bacon? That's so, going to be hard. I can let go of the pork chop. It's the bacon. You can do it. Listen, fo- follow this. So eliminate pork first. And then after you eliminate pork, and that comes with the pork, bacon, and all that stuff, then you go to beef. Then you eliminate beef. And then after beef, you eliminate chicken and turkey, right? So chicken first and then turkey. And then after you eliminate the chicken and the turkey, then what else is there to eat? Fish, right? You eliminate fish last because now you become a pescatarian and pescatarians eat fish and shellfish and seafood and all that stuff, which is something that I love before I went vegan. Like I love crabs, right? But fish was the last thing that I eliminate. So now you got rid of the meats and then obviously you don't eat dairy. So that's easy. Dairy was the last thing that I gave up before I went completely vegan. So after the fish, you fully give up cheese or whatever, all of the dairy and bada bing, bada boom, and you're vegan. Now that that's the practical steps. Now here's the other thing. I don't think that the agenda should be for you to go cold turkey vegan if it feels like it's not natural to you, right? The agenda here is that you incorporate items into your lifestyle where you el- you looking at me like, mm-hmm, yeah. no, I'm, I'm trying. No, I'm like listening. It. I'm, like I'm all in. I ain't gonna lie, Pinky. The first thing you said, it sounded like it was Japanese. You like giving up. Every, every time you said a meat, I'm like, God <laughs> damn. You mean- but it's not hard. So, like, Let me tell you. Because there's so much innovation behind plant-based food that you can be eating something plant-based and not even realize that it's vegan 
and you think that you're eating meat because there is so much innovation around it. There is vegan cheese that tastes better than the real thing right now. It's right? the mindset. So like, it, and it's all about your mindset. It's just like you waking up to go brush your teeth. You're going to wake up and brush your teeth every day because you know that's something that's just innate in you. Mm-hmm. And it's just like eating vegan. But again, my messaging is, is if you don't want to go fully vegan, you don't have to. Like we live in a society where you should be able to make your own choices and be comfortable in them. My messaging to you is just incorporate something different. Mm-hmm. And once you start to realize that you can eat vegan food, okay, this ain't that bad. Okay, I can go to another restaurant and try it. Then naturally you'll be like, okay, I could do this and you'll start to eliminate the other stuff like the pork bacon and the scramble and the pork chops and all the other stuff that you eat and yeah thick ass pork chop <laughs> all right we're gonna let you get out of here pinky but before you do i got one more question um the book is i hope you fail pinky cole you guys if you want a role model not just in entrepreneurship but in also how to own a room it's very few people i've ever seen walk into a room and just own the room the whole time i'm doing the show with pinky we did a show Bet on Black on Revolt earlier this year. I'm like, yo, I'm 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 taking notes on how to just come in there and take the room over. Uh, Pinky is a good North Star for that. I do want to ask you about one thing. The Atlanta food scene right now is on fire. Okay, <laughs> y'all had a guy come down there and turn your city <laughs> upside down. Now he did not visit Slutty Vegan for what I for he didn't go to Keith Lee. He didn't come yeah. to Slutty Vegan. He didn't come to Slutty Vegan. I want to know oh, what, I, I don't know why. I don't know why. Maybe because you guys are, maybe you guys are too established. I don't know why. So I, you would want him to though. You would want Keith Lee at Slutty Vegan. I wanted him to come. I reached out to him. I'm like, hey, stop by my restaurant. So I'm like, is this a bad thing or a good thing that he didn't want to come? And most people said he didn't come. So you good. It, <laughs> I it think it's a good thing. Like, <laughs> it looks as if he went to a lot of more startup restaurants. I mean, he, he attempted old lady gang, shout out to them, but he, um, he went to some, I never even heard of a lot of the restaurants that he went to. Mm-hmm. Uh, but what was your question? So that The question this. is, the discourse, we even had it here on the show about Keith Lee. Some people think Keith Lee is illuminating, shedding light on real issues with customer service and, and Black-owned establishments, particularly in Atlanta. And some people think what he's doing, what he did when he was in Atlanta was bad-mouthing black owned businesses with his reviews after he had left there. Right. Mm-hmm. You obviously a very prominent Atlanta black owned uh, restaurateur. Mm-hmm. What are your thoughts about how things went when Keith Lee did his food tour in Atlanta? So first of all, I didn't know who Keith Lee was before he came to Atlanta. So when everybody started saying Keith Lee, Keith, I'm like, who are they talking about? Right. right? We, we get a lot of food bloggers that come to our business all the time. So when I found out about him, I sent him a message. I'm like, okay, hey, you coming to Atlanta? Like, you should come and stop by Slutty Vegan. So he didn't stop by Slutty Vegan. He also didn't stop by my husband's restaurant either. Big What's Dave's, your husband's restaurant? Big Dave's Cheese Steaks. Okay, Cheese yeah, yeah, steaks. yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Look at you, Rich. <laughs> <laughs> I just love that, it's so, that they're so different. Y'all have two totally it's different still, restaurants. So very different. <laughs> but, but what I will say is, that this is two-part, right? I want people, not just Keith Lee, to walk a mile in a restaurant tour shoes. It is the hardest industry to be in and be successful in. So, you know, restaurant tours got to deal with customer service issues. They got to deal with how they're going to pay the bills. It's a recession right now. So they got to deal with making sure that their food costs is low. They got to pay their employees. They got to like make sure that their business is clean. There are a lot of things to deal with that you got to be a very, very special individual to be able to master all those things. And most times we fall short because we don't have the right team, right? That's the first piece of it. So Keith Lee coming to a lot of these restaurants, most of these people don't have the right resources to have the right team, partially because they just want to keep the lights on. That's the first thing. It affects the customer, right? I want to be clear. It does affect the customer, but I want to salute all of the restaurant tours in Atlanta because opening and keeping a restaurant open in Atlanta is is probably harder than the damn Olympics, okay? So if Keith Lee can go in there and start his own restaurant and make it successful, kudos to him. But I also want people to understand that you got to give grace um, to a certain extent for businesses that are thriving and trying to do the right thing. That's the first thing. Secondly, I think 
that as a black owned business, we have a responsibility to make sure that we got the right people on our team. Because as you know, you can go in another restaurant um, that's not black owned and you won't get the same criticism. You can go into a big brand restaurant and they could tear your food up. You can find a roach in your food. You can find something in your food and you ain't going to write a review and call corporate. You ain't going to do that. All you're going to do is like, I'm not eating there again. But if it's a black owned business, Everybody's going to be talking about it. You're going to humiliate them online. And I feel like there is a higher expectation for a Black-owned business to do exceedingly abundantly well than a regular normal business. And sometimes it is a little bit unfair. Um, So I have not watched all of his reviews. Um, I think what he's doing on a positive level in highlighting businesses that weren't getting a lot of business, I think that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Um, But my PSA to Atlanta restaurants is just making sure your stuff is zip tight. Right. What I care about is customer service. Right. I don't care about nothing else. Customer service and making sure that the energy in the room is good and that your restaurant is clean are very, very important to me. And that is how I built my business. And somebody asked me to do kind of like a town hall with other business. Obviously, like I'm not the end all be all, but I've learned a lot along the way. And I would like to show other restaurant tours in Atlanta. But I feel like the Atlanta restaurant scene is cool. It's Atlanta. We can do what we want to do. Oh, see? What that that's, That's what he what was talking about, Pinky, because it's Atlanta and y'all can do what y'all want to do. He was mad. <laughs> Listen, the reality of it is, is Atlanta is the black mecca of excellence, right? So if they mm-hmm. want to close on Mondays, that's their rules. I'm closed. I was closed on Sundays and Mondays for the last five years up until three weeks ago. So if you want to <laughs> close up at a certain time, if you don't want to take people, that is your prerogative. See that means I'm that you'll lose customers and you will lose revenue. And then you got to deal with that on the bottom line. But at the end of the day, all restaurants go through stuff. Nobody is perfect. Mm-hmm. And shout out to the restaurants that he did highlight. And I pray that they get the business um, that they do deserve, uh, good, bad, or indifferent. And hopefully they find things to fix their restaurant so that it never happens again. Yeah. That, was, was, my, I, that was my answer. So <laughs> I, uh, I was coming to Atlanta. I'm not coming now because they canceled the thing, but I was coming to Atlanta. I was going to Juicy Jerk, the place where he had the jerk <laughs> uh, chicken. And he said it was the best he had ever had. Um, but yeah, so that's Pink yeah. Cole. Hope You Fail is the book. You guys, if you're looking for someone to pattern yourself after, I still think, I, honestly, I think there should be more Pinky Cole. I think there should be TED Talks, master classes. I think there should be entrepreneur seminars, like all the stuff that you're doing all over the place. I do, really do not think there's a better yeah. person in our culture to learn from. Uh, we appreciate you joining us on mm-hmm. Higher Learning today. Thank you, Pinky. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. All right, Thank you. Bye. So look, I love Pinky Cole. Fantastic. Mm-hmm. I want to I wanna throw in a surprise topic real quick. You already did with the Marvels. No, that's not a surprise topic. That's in the rundown. It got added in. Okay. <laughs> Way late, like okay. while I was driving in. I want to I wanna add a, a, a topic here. I want to call it, is, am I an asshole? Well, yes. See? See what I'm saying? Donnie. Do we need a segment for me to tell you that? Damn. <laughs> What's up? Hold on, that hurt, man. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> 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 that that not gonna lie, man. That was that was tough. You set yourself up for that. I did. <laughs> um so, Donnie, you're a Michigan fan. <laughs> I am. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. This is not so, I love this. So Michigan beat <laughs> Penn State. Okay, just for some background, you guys. Michigan has been under attack or under investigation for a sign stealing scandal. There was a Michigan assistant coach that allegedly has been fired now, was buying tickets to different Big Ten teams' games and watching from the stands and stealing their signs. Now, so you guys know, in the NFL, you can't really do this because there is audio inside the helmets. So when the signs come in in the NFL, or when the plays come in in the NFL, they're coming into the, the helmet of the quarterback. You know, there might be some sign usage, but it's not as important. Sometimes you'll see the quarterback doing like this, putting his because he's trying to block out the noise and hear the signs mm-hmm. right? and, and hear the calls. Cool. Doesn't have that in college for all kinds of reasons. Number one, There's not helmet uniformity in college. Different technologies being used by different conferences, different helmet styles being used by different conferences, all kinds of stuff like that. There's no audio inside of them. So they signal plays in. They signal the plays in. And so if you know a play is coming, theoretically, you could stack your box or 
change your coverage, roll your coverage, do whatever based on the call. It would be a competitive advantage if you could do that. Michigan has been accused of doing that. Okay, there's an investigation. The head coach from Michigan, Jim Harbaugh, was suspended for the last three days, the last three games. The first game was a slightly big game against a team that they pretty much fuck over every year in Penn State. But it's always a competitive fuck over. Penn State loses two games every year, and it's to Ohio State and to Michigan. They can beat almost everybody else with a quarterback who can't throw the ball, but they're going to lose the two games that they played to Ohio State and Michigan. It's like clockwork. Mm -hmm. Michigan beat Ohio, beat Penn State. Mm -hmm. It wasn't particularly competitive. They pretty much whopped their asses worse than the final score says. And the assistant coach, I think his name was Shaheen Moore. Sharon. 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 The assistant coach, Sharon Moore, was interviewed, took over the, the, the sidelines for Michigan. He was interviewed after the game. This is him. I want to thank the Lord. I want to thank Coach Harbaugh. I fucking love you, man. I love the shit out of you, man. This is for you. For this university, the president, our AD. We got the best players, best university, best alumni in the country. Love you guys. These fucking guys right here. These guys right here, man. These guys did it. These guys did it, man. Talk to him, man. Love you. Thank you, Coach. Okay. I just want to say, <laughs> like, I'm watching this. Aliko <laughs> walks by and she goes, yo, why is he crying? <laughs> I was watching this live. Why is he crying? So look, I-, I would like to take the time to shout out one of my mentors, um, Jason Wilson. The book is called uh, Battle Cry. Mm-hmm. It's a book that he has out. Cry Like a Man is another book. I have no problem with crying. I shed tears. Am I an asshole for thinking this is too much? <laughs> this motherfucker is crying like a freed slave. <laughs> when, when they won a football game against a team that they always beat after they got caught Isn't for it stealing alleged? signs. Isn't it alleged? They suspended him. They fired the coach. I'm pretty fucking sure they did it. Am I? It. I'm not saying that men can't cry because that would be so, like, it, it, it's not the cry. It's okay. It's not the cursing for you to say the runaway. <laughs> the runaway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, I got yeah, a little yeah, too much yeah, Vaseline. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, okay. Well, it's been sitting there for a while. You should have been told me that. I can't win with this. Am mother. I? <laughs> like, God damn. After I came like, yeah, like, I put that Vaseline on hours ago. Yeah, I didn't see it before. Minutes you can't ago. win. Yeah. Okay. It's not the crying. It's not the cursing. It's not the thanking God. It's the all of that with we did this for you. It was that what was given the mass of feels like we did this for you. I, like all of this emotion is for horrible. Like, it's, it, like, that's what threw me off. It wasn't like, man, this is, so, oh, sorry for the hit. Man, this has been a rough week. Man, like, we really had to grind through it. Get, like, it's been, it's weighed on us a lot. Like, sort of, so to get this, I feel like I'm just releasing this win. I'm releasing all this motion. Everybody was emotion. Everyone was against us. It's not these players' fault. Like, for the players, I'm just so glad that they were able to, you know, like, come together and win. I could understand that speech with the tears. Mm -hmm. It was the, we did this for you, Massa. It was the implied Massa, I think, that that is uh, getting to you. So it's not, okay, this is what I would say. (laughs) We move on. First of all, (laughs) Donnie, your thoughts. Donnie's a huge Michigan fan. What do you think, Donnie? It, uh, it's embarrassing. It's crazy. (laughs) I (laughs) preach. But I'm, it's, I think, when it comes to Michigan fans are the ones that I've like talked to and like seen on Twitter uh, since this, not everybody's on the same page. Not everybody is as cringed out about this. Some people think that this is dope, which is, uh, I, I don't know. I can't, I can't, it's just weird. It's cringy. And it's one of those things where I love cringy things. I normally like don't shy away from it or want, want to change the channel, but I contemplated not 
hearing him out by the end of that because that was just like almost too much for me. Question. Okay. Then we can move on. It's okay to cry. Mm -hmm. It's you should cry. Does it matter why you cry? Like, yes, of course. I remember one time, you know, we was in high school or middle school. We we're in Greek mythology class. And, you know, every Wednesday, just running the film strip. You were yeah. in the film strip, the Greek mythology film strip, right? Right, the film strip. And for some reason, it was my turn to run the film strip, but I got skipped over. Oh. This was in the seventh grade. I got okay. skipped over. You know why? I can't remember why, but I wanted to run the film strip. I wanted to be in charge of it. <laughs> I don't know why I became emotional. <laughs> Your feelings were hurt. I remember this girl looked at me and she was like, are you about to cry? <laughs> 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 and it, and it and look, I cry, I cry at the end of movies. Yeah, I, I cry, you, you know what I mean? But if you go to like <laughs> Popeye's, you know, and they out of spicy, can you just cry? I mean, it's, 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 doesn't it, 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 doesn't it, it doesn't it say something about, you can't, I mean, you, you can cry, but what should if, you cry? Why? Like, what if, what if the last time that you had spicy was like, I don't know, it took you back to the time the guy broke up with you, y'all were at Popeye's and you had ordered a two piece dark spicy and the fact that they were out of spicy let, reminded you of the time he, no. Left you. Like he no. went out on the relationship. I feel like you got like there, there, like there might be a connection. The chicken might trigger something else. No. But I'm not mad that he cried here. I, 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 he shouldn't have cried, bro. I'm not mad that he cried. It was all of it. Uh, it I'm saying right now, he shouldn't have cried. Well, you're an asshole. I'm an asshole. Donnie, am I an asshole? You are. It's not the tears. <laughs> it's how it sounded. Is I'm just saying, it's I, I, you guys. I admit I have work to do. Like I cry, I cry a lot. But just there, and then I can understand if it was worthy. You know, if three team, three players got kicked off the team for protesting, or but he they got caught cheating. How did they get caught? I can't remember. Donnie, do you remember? Maybe other teams I turned them in. Yeah, that's exactly what it was. Yeah, like okay. so everybody saw this same coach at all the games. Like, how did he not go incognito? I guess he had to be close to the sideline. Yeah, to see it. Like, yeah, he so, probably had to have good. No, no, seats. no. He was no. He was yeah. He was probably buying good seats. But I think other teams turned him in. But like, and he also was caught on being on the sidelines. There's video of him in Central Michigan here <laughs> with like glasses <laughs> incognito behind the coach. So he tried to disguise himself. Bro, this nigga's a dog. <laughs> yeah, that guy is going all the way. What's his name again? He, he, he has black? some kind of crazy name. Huh. Connor Stallions. Connor Stallions. Connor Stallions is going all the way. I don't know about all the way more. where he's going all the way, bro. <laughs> That's enterprising. Jim Harbaugh, you sneaky motherfucker. They gonna have to. Okay, let's move on. Um, last thing, Tisha Campbell found her dad's porn stash. Uh, <laughs> couldn't just move past this. You know what I hear? I went through this. I feel like you you told you. T I don't know if you said it on the podcast, but. I remember you telling me. Uh, Tisha Campbell's father, Clifton Campbell, passed away on November 1st, 76. And she was going through her stuff and she found this. Go ahead. You got to be the one to yeah. find the bullshit. We going through my dad's shit. Oh, Look man. at this. Look at oh, this oh, bullshit. Oh, oh, they give that oh, kid. He he oh, my God. Oh, oh, my God. God. Jesus. Jesus. Cut it off. I just want to say I've never, ever, ever, ever related to something more. Uh, my dad passed away. And so I go into his house. Ebony's going to be so mad. I go into his house and I'm looking through all of his stuff because when it happens, it's just like this snapshot of the life that they were living when they passed away. Sure. So, you know, I'm looking at all, I'm looking at what he was eating, you know, what he had in his kitchen, the condition of his house. I see Gavin toys, my little brother, my little, his toys in the, in the living room. So I'm like, man, you know, he was still raising a young son. I go into his bedroom and it's 
it's like, it's almost like he's alive. Like I go into his bedroom and when I go into his bedroom, the outdoor channel is playing. Mm. Like whatever happened, it happened too quick for them to cut the TV off, mm-hmm. right? When it was, when she was taking them to the hospital. Um, because I was there the the day after, the day after, after that he passed away. Mm-hmm. Like he passed away the, the, the fourth, I flew out the fifth, whatever. So it's all, everything is just how he left it. He was just there. Yeah. His whole room is filled with all of his hunting stuff. His saddle is still on its horse. Like he, his his spirit has left, but he's still present in the in the room. So I'm going there. I'm looking through all the stuff. I'm freaking out, man. I'm losing it. It smells like my dad the whole nine. And I get to the top of his closet, and I'm looking around because I'm ta- I'm taking guns out of the house mm-hmm. because he had so many different guns that nobody's going to be in there. I didn't want somebody to go in there and steal his guns. Now you got guns on the street and they're registered him. So I'm taking guns out of the house. Anything that's valuable, I'm taking it out of the house. I'm taking that saddle. It's probably like six, $700. Mm-hmm. I'm taking the guns. I'm taking all of that stuff, making sure everything's locked up. And when I'm getting the stuff from the top, there's like lube up there and there's other stuff for sex oh. with, with ladies. And then he still was keeping the gangster with the old school DVDs, man. Dad was on that booty talk. Dad, dad had one called Big Butt Bundles or something that was Brazilian. He was going in still. And it's so crazy because when you look on the thing on his bed, there's a breathing machine. For Tisha. No, no, for my father. Oh, same with her. That's what people were talking, her dad. As well. Oh, for real? Yeah, yeah. They were saying that there was like a breathing machine. Yeah, there was a breathing machine. My dad had like a breathing machine that was connected to a thing to help him breathe. He had congestive heart failure. This nigga was still jacking off. God (laughs) damn. It's crazy. It's crazy still. And by the way, one of his girlfriends took him to the hospital. She was with him when when it happened. So it's like, is it ever going to stop? (laughs) <laughs> it, it, does it ever stop? Well, and when I saw this, it, it, it's like, it's weird, you guys. I know this seems weird. That comforted her. Oh, yeah. I think it, finding comic relief yeah. in pain is a real thing. I think what some people were saying, and this is what I, and obviously I know your answer now because you just did it, but I was going to say, I think there was some criticism as, that was a moment for you and your family to laugh and find some like lightness, light in the darkness. But should she have taken that to social media and shared that with social media? Like, cause at, we didn't, we didn't play the whole clip, but at the end of the clip, she's like renaming the, the, the DVDs that are like mm-hmm. very graphic, obviously. And so some people were kind of like, is that, was that great for your father? Was that, did that, you know, like, would he have been embarrassed for that kind of thing? And so I would say, what would you say? But then you as well named the DVDs that you found. Well, for, the so, only thing I'll say for me is it's been two years. Okay, okay. And so during that time, and I, I, I probably wouldn't for the I mean, look, everybody's different. I probably wouldn't just because the rest of my family, the emotions were uh, so raw. Mm-hmm. But it's been two years. It's mm-hmm. been two years now. So looking at it, it was so familiar that I actually connected to it. Mm-hmm. So you'd be surprised during that time, like what makes you laugh, right? Because oh, for sure. I go in, so I leave out of his room and I go into his truck. And because I'm looking for his gun, I know the gun is around. Mm-hmm. If so, if the gun ain't in there, somebody done stole the gun, like the big 357 Magnum joint. So I'm looking for it. So I go in there and I'm, I'm looking for the gun and I go into the truck and he was living a truck life and a bedroom life. Because in the truck, there was two Bibles. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> what else? Do you have a crossing? The, from- he had the cross. <laughs> in the truck, there was two Bibles. There was the cross. It was all wholesome. Inside the truck, because he carried, I, I got the two little Bibles in my um in my bookcase now. He carried two little Bibles. 
mm-hmm. wherever he would go. And he would tell me, he would be like, carry two Bibles because I'm going to need one, but you never know if somebody else is going to need one. I give them a Aww. little Bible. You know what I mean? Um, so he was probably carrying the two Bibles. With the same hand? But the, with the same, he was probably <laughs> carrying the two Bibles because he needed that much of the word after he had left what was going on. I guess no. That's funny though. <laughs> <laughs> I love you, Dad. All right. Tell you think caps off, but do not stop learning. I am Van Lathan Jr. I'm Rachel Lynn Lindsay. Bye, guys. <laughs>